watching The Business of Law, the only web TV show focused on the challenges and the opportunities facing the legal profession. I'm Kent Zimmerman. I'm delighted that we're joined today by a partner from a very well-known New York firm that's extremely well-known in the world of finance, banking, and a number of other areas, Dan Zubkoff, partner and a member of the leadership team at Cahill Gordon. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Absolutely. So let's start by talking a little bit about the firm. And a lot of people know that you're a big deal in the world of banking and finance, also in a number of other areas in the high yield world, very significant player, if not one of the most significant, also in leveraged loans, very big deal there. But what some people might not know as well is with what kind of strength the firm has performed with financially. And that's particularly the case since 2008. And if you look at the data reported, at least by the American lawyer, against other firms in the industry, you guys have really hit it out of the park on a lot of key metrics. On gross revenue, up very significantly. On gross revenue, they report in those five years, you're up 56%. On revenue per lawyer, up very significantly. Why is it that in a period since 08, after Lehman fell, a lot of other firms have struggled? Why is it that Cahill has performed with such strength? What are the drivers? Well, I think if you go back, obviously the financial crisis, uh, the biggest impact of the financial crisis was on firms' transactional practices. In 2008, uh, there was no bid for financial instruments on the buy side. All the buyers had become sellers between 2007 and 2008. And so if you look back a year to 2007, uh, we were involved in a lot of major LBO transactions where we were representing the, the banks and the other financial institutions who had committed loans, committed to underwrite securities to finance some very, very large leverage buyouts. And in fact, in that period, the deal size really dwarfed anything that preceded it or, or that has followed it. And what we saw in the summer of 2007, you can almost pinpoint it to a particular week in July of that summer, um, demand just dried up. And it was sort of the, one of the, you know, the canary in the coal mine about the financial crisis that was about to unfold. And um, when demand dried up, we had clients with billions, tens of billions, even hundreds of billions of dollars of committed financings that had to be done in service of acquisition transactions. And we spent the balance of 2007 and 2008, and in some cases even into 2009, working through those scenarios to help our clients uh, mitigate their potential losses on those commitments in a market where there was no buy side demand because our clients plan to syndicate the commitments that they provide for these transactions to you know, a buy side market. So that helped us weather a very uh, barren 2008 otherwise in terms of deal activity. And then you had Lehman Fall, as you mentioned, in uh, September of 2008 and really sort of a breakdown in the financial system. And the two administrations in transition, I think, did a great job helping to put the whole thing back together to the point where in early 2009, you saw the stirrings, the emergence of the leveraged finance market again, which was really the first market to recover uh, from the crisis. And, uh, and so we saw a lot of deal flow immediately in 2009 because issuers and borrowers who hadn't been able to go to market in 2008 who needed access to financing, you know, were, were there to do it and the banks were there to support them. So we were able to kind of weather that through sort of this continuation of transactions that were already committed to and that became more complex because they needed to be worked out and restructured into a 2009 recovery market in the leveraged finance market. So when I, when I look at Cahill, particularly against other firms, some of your peers, other firms in the market, I see a firm that appears to know its areas of focus, and it's certainly not trying to be all things to all people or all industries. Is that something that you see too, a firm that's chosen its areas of focus? And if you do, has that played a role in your performance as a firm? I, the answer to that is yes. I think that um, we, uh, we're not a large firm, and so we've, we've tried to limit our focus to areas that we can be very high value to our client. We, um, 
we really respond to the demands of our clients for uh, services, we focus on financial institution clients. And one of the challenges and opportunities, sort of flip sides of the same coin, that, that emerged from 2008 and 2009 was, you know, we, as everyone did, really were expecting a huge regulatory response and an enforcement response to what had transpired during the financial crisis. And so we looked to beef up um, our capabilities in certain areas. So we added from the outside, from both the government and from other firms, highly selectively, some highly qualified individuals to help us with our corporate investigations work, our regulatory work, our securities litigation work, and so that we could be responsive to client demands for providing services in those areas. We also added capacity to leverage finance from outside because we thought we saw very good opportunities. We, we saw our clients actually consolidate the firms they were using post, during, and after the financial crisis because having gone through the, these very difficult experiences, they wanted to be sure that they were surrounding themselves with the most experienced lawyers. So we tried to make sure that we had those people available to them. So I see in the industry, you've got consolidation, you've got globalization. There's a lot of change, and I think a lot of people would say the industry's in transition to some extent. You all have been extremely successful, but I look to the future and I wonder what Cahill looks like in five or 10 years. You've recently doubled down, I know, on London. What, what, t tell us a little bit about that, but also what does the future hold for the firm? Well, I, I think just in terms of London, one of the things that we've observed is there has been increasingly a convergence of efforts between UK financial regulators and US financial regulators concerning you know, some of the various issues that our financial institution clients are dealing with globally. And so we are uh, increasing our presence. Uh, we're hiring solicitors in the UK to interface directly with UK regulators so that we can provide sort of a co coordinated platform for our clients to service their needs in these sort of coordinated regulatory efforts. Uh, and we're increasing our footprint significantly in London. We're in the process of doing that now, and we're increasing our size there. So, so that, that's kind of, that's a demand-driven response. And that's how we sort of will focus our, continue to focus our efforts. Five or 10 years, you know, what technology is gonna do to the legal business, who knows? Um, we think that if anything, other than for personal interfacing with regulators or things like that, the, a geographical presence around the world may be less relevant, but we'll see. You know, we, we, it remains to be seen. But we're very uh, US focused in terms of our operations at the, for the time being. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your areas of focus and what you see now and ahead. Um, on the IPO front, what, how are you feeling about the flow this year compared to what you saw last year? And also, what do you see ahead for the balance of the year into next year? Well, you know, in terms of what what uh, the market portends, for that you need a qualified investment bank or equity capital markets person to really give you, you know, a meaningful insight into it. But from what we're seeing, we're seeing a very good flow in the IPO market. Uh, we're also seeing a, an interesting trend where um, uh, owners of assets, for example, financial sponsors, are looking to monetize those assets with a variety of different, different potential ways of doing it. So they may file an IPO. They may also engage in a concurrent sale process where they seek a better valuation on, on, you know, by selling the company entirely versus monetizing it through the IPO. Or absent those things, they may do a dividend recap where they borrow money at a holding company or at the operating company and pay a cash dividend so that the owners can get a return on their asset. But in any event, we're seeing sort of a multiple, multi-strategy approach to monetizing assets. Has that, is that something that's changed over time compared to what you saw historically? I think the trend is in that direction. I, we've seen it before, we've seen it last year, but I mean, I think if you went back five years, that would be more unusual, certainly. And I think, so this is more directionally kind of, I think people are just adopting that, uh, you know, the vagaries of the equity markets, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. I wanted to ask you about clients and their expectations of firms they hire, like you guys and others. You hear from many firms, including many high-performing firms, that there's this tremendous 
downward pricing pressure, and that's often driven not just by the spend on legal, but on the on the spend on all things that companies buy, and then legal kind of gets caught up in a in a mentality, a procurement mentality. Some people would say that has even hit some high end firms and high end practices. Do you see any difference in terms of client expectations and client pricing pressure? Do you do you see different things from clients when they're buying legal services and having a relationship with you than you used to? Well, I think one thing that clients are looking for, particularly clients that are experiencing a very large litigation load, is they're looking for some predictability in what their legal spend is going to be. And so we negotiate occasionally, on occasion, where we're warranted, you know, arrangements where the client is sort of assured of what its legal spend is and we provide the services, you know, in return for that. And, uh, you know, we try to do it in a way that, that works with the client's budget but also works with our own uh, needs to try to maintain our profit margins and, you know, not have our realization rate lowered or our profit margins lowered as a result. So we do a lot of analysis around that and try to come up with creative ideas that help the clients manage their spend. When other firms look at Cahill and they see the strength of your financial performance since 08 and before that as well, when they say, we want to be like Cahill, we want to do a better job of managing our firm, growing our firm, finding our areas of strength, is there advice you would give to other firms that look at Cahill and admire Cahill? Well, that's kind of your job, Ken. I <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think that um, all, all we try to do is kind of stick to our knitting. We, we manage our costs very closely. We, we look at spending as an investment. We look at it as spending our partner's money. So before we just go out and willy-nilly spend our partner's money, we try to... Uh, make sure that there's a good justification for it. In particular, when we look at expanding in areas or geographically, we want to make sure that we feel that there's a modicum of demand to support it. People look at firms like Cahill, firms like Cravath, other firms here in New York, and they would distinguish between the firms that have a New York strategy and a strategy to grow in other places. Some want to grow in the world's money centers, others want to grow in other places depending on the choices they make and what they want to focus on. The New York strategy appears to apply to Cahill and, and Cravath and others. Is that the strategy that you think the firm will have for the long term? Well, I kind of inherently, yes. I mean, in, in the sense that our, um, our management, if you, such as it is, are, are full-time lawyers as well. And the idea of sort of exploring new markets and finding out how to be a successful lawyer in Asia or in South America, that requires a lot of effort uh, as opposed to guesswork to, to have the right level of knowledge to effectively do it. And I, I just don't see us putting the effort. I think we'd rather uh, spend the time working with our clients. It's produced great results so far. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan. Thanks nice. for coming in. Thank you. I'm Kent Zimmerman. Thank you very much for watching. You've been watching The Business of Law. And on behalf of Lee Packia and the whole team here, thank you for watching.